the China Bloc, the alliance of China with Pakistan, Myanmar, and North Korea. Marshalling allies into a friendly China bloc is a major determinant of whether China will manage to become a major regional or global power. States that challenge the status quo of the international system can usually find like-minded, alienated states. But global hegemons can marshal together large coalitions to help maintain the international system. According to hegemonic stability theory, the leading global power provides public goods in the form of an international trading system and the protection with a navy. Now a public good is a good that you're providing other states in which it cannot reduce their access to that good. So ending piracy benefits everybody, not only the country that has removed the piracy, and other countries also benefit, even if it wasn't intentional that they, that they, that they would benefit from it. Nor can they be excluded from the benefit, because once you get rid of pirates, well, the pirates are gone. The allies of a hegemon, however, typically also benefit from the current distribution of benefits in the international system and help the hegemon in maintaining that system. These alliances are pragmatic and based on shared national interests, but are also based on shared normative values that underlie the governance of the international system. For the U.S., the normative values are typically liberal values or market-based capitalist values. Alliances matter because they can add significant offensive or defensive power to a state. Countries may join an alliance because they're seeking to counter a common adversary, or because they're under pressure from the dominant state to bandwagon, in other words, joining the bigger state out of fear, or at least modifying the foreign policy to follow whatever alignment the near threat wants the state to follow. A classic example is Finland during the Cold War. Too far away from having any allies and too far away from NATO help, Finland bandwagoned with the Soviet Union. It neutralized its foreign policy to fall in line with that of Moscow. States will bandwagon when they have no available allies nearby to join with and will balance when allies are easily available. States may therefore change rapidly between bandwagoning and balancing postures given the circumstances. The looser a state's commitment to an alliance, the more likely it will face abandonment by its ally. The greater the level of demonstrated commitment to an alliance, the greater the likelihood the ally will be emboldened to cause a conflict and chain gang. In other words, drag the allied state into the conflict with it, counter to the ally's interests. So this is the trade-off. A country wants assurances that it's going to be protected. And the country that's providing the assurance wants to convince the country that it's giving it to not to switch sides. On the other hand, if the commitment is too strong, then the smaller state may trigger wars knowing that the larger state will be compelled to provide assistance anyway and drag it into a war it didn't otherwise want to get into. This was the major reason for the First World War. Germany facing a rising Russia needed the power of Austria-Hungary as an ally, even though Austria-Hungary was in a state of collapse and therefore would lead Germany to be dragged into a conflict uh, caused by the collapse of Austria-Hungary. Here you can see in red states that are very friendly with China, either through commerce uh, or because they have common ideology or common uh, regime types, in other words authoritarian regimes that are generally hostile to Western countries, it doesn't necessarily mean countries that would fight with China. You can see below one of the typical uh, left-wing uh, pro-Chinese uh, conferences. Now it's states seeking Chinese influence. These are states that want China to be strong and to impart to China some of its status and perhaps some weapons in order to counterbalance local threats. Iran, for example, is very isolated from by the Western world and so benefits from Chinese weapons and commerce. Cambodia benefits with the Chinese presence to offset uh, the influence from Vietnam. Uh, it didn't help Cambodia in 1978 when Vietnam invaded and consequently China retaliated by invading Vietnam in 1979 which failed. 
North Korea depends on Chinese support to keep its regime from collapsing vis-a-vis -vis the much wealthier South Korea. Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Pakistan are all trying to counterbalance India. Cuba in the Caribbean is seeking an ally to replace the Soviet Union and Zimbabwe. Aside from having historical ties that helped the party get into power, also need to counterbalance Western pressure against its regime. You can see in the bottom left map a 10-year-old uh, depiction of U.S. bases surrounding China. So these are states unfriendly to the U.S. in the world. And these are, there are some states here that are unfriendly to the U.S. but not necessarily allied to China, but nevertheless shows the candidates of alienated states within the international system, many in the Middle East, that would likely join China if China looked like it was a candidate that would win. These are states under pressure to bandwagon with China. Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Myanmar, South Korea, Mongolia, Thailand, Laos. So these countries would prefer autonomy in most cases, but are facing undue pressure to align with China. Thailand is a democracy. It does have a long history of good relations with China, largely for balance of power reasons, which is they have common adversaries like Vietnam in Southeast Asia, but Thailand doesn't necessarily want to align as closely with China as China wants it to. South Korea has most of its trade with China. So there's a lot of economic pressure, along with Mongolia also, a lot of economic uh, interaction there. But Mongolia neither wants to be influenced by Russia or China, and so it's made precarious links with the West. Now you can compare China's allies that we're gonna look at in this discussion with US treaty allies. US has 84 formal treaty allies spread out across the planet, most of which, and the strongest of which, are in Europe, followed by allies in the uh, Pacific littoral, countries like Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, Australia, the Philippines, New Zealand, and other locations, and then less solid relations with countries in the Middle East and South America. This is the typical alliance network of any great systemic power, typically the maritime power that is a guarantor of international trade. So you can see in the green, these are countries that feel threatened by China in some way, either territorial or there is an ethnic population or there's historical claims so you have, of course, the U.S. itself, which is a rival. You've got uh, the Philippines, South Korea, Japan, uh, Indonesia, Thailand, Mongolia, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan. You've got countries that have actually been attacked by China. Uh, and you've got here, of course, Vietnam, uh, India, Russia, uh, plus uh, some of the uh, other neighbors. And there are countries that have been helped by China, like Afghanistan and Cambodia. Uh, Taiwan, of course, uh, should be blue. China has had seven historical periods of alliances. Historical dynastic China. This refers specifically to the Ming and the Qing dynasties. China's alliance is focused on bandwagoning tributary states on its periphery and submissive alliances with stronger nomadic nations in the northern plains. The main threats were Japanese pirates, uh, Northern Khitan and Mongol nomads, Portuguese, Dutch, English and French maritime forces, and Russian land forces. The second historical period is the late Qing alliances from 1875 to 1911. Here China suffers a gradual loss of tributary allies. It has no military allies. Arms providers are principally from Germany and the UK. The main threat are Japanese, English, French, German, American maritime forces and Russian land forces. <laughs> 
The third period is the Republican-Chinese alliances from 1911 to 1949. China's allies were the U.S., the Soviet Union, Germany, and British military assistance in China's war effort against Japan. Germany initially was involved sympathetically with China. They sent an advisor, Falkenhayn, who helped organize the Chinese military. And as you can see, the Chinese uh, military, the Guomintang, has adopted German-formed uniforms. But when Germany joined the Axis and allied with Japan, uh, the Germans left and Chuikov came in on behalf of the Soviet Union as an advisor. The Soviet Union, of course, uh, helped found the Guomintang as a political party, uh, essentially uh, for the purposes of uniting China against Western encroachment. Now, the Soviet Union pulled out because they didn't want to antagonize Japan uh, in the lead up to the German attack on the Soviet Union. They didn't want Japan to seize the Russian Far East in the moment of the Soviet Union's weakness because it was focused on defeating Nazi Germany. So they pulled out and then the Americans sent Stilwell who had a raucous interaction with the uh, leader of the Kuomintang, Chiang Kai-shek, and was ultimately replaced by Vedemeyer. The fourth historical period is the early Cold War alliance from 1949 to 1958. The Allies were the Soviet Union, North Korea, North Vietnam, and friendly relations with the non-aligned movement, including India, Yugoslavia, Indonesia, and Egypt. The main threat at this time was the U.S. and Taiwan, and particularly the U.S. Uh, deployed in South Korea, which uh, China interpreted as a terrestrial threat since the Yalu River frontier with North Korea was very close to Beijing, uh, China's uh, capital. The fifth period was the Middle Cold War Alliance period from 1962 to 1971. China's allies were Albania, North Vietnam, and Pakistan, uh, especially from the latter end of that period. The main threat was uh, the Indian threat to Tibet, which was resolved by the 1962 war, the Chinese capture of the Aksai Chin, and the Soviet land threat up to the kuro patkin line uh, in uh, the northern Chinese plain. The late Cold War alliance was the sixth period from 1971 to 1989. The Allies were the US, Pakistan, North Korea, Zimbabwe, and friendly relations with Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, and Bangladesh. China had backed the insurgents uh, who won in Zimbabwe and consequently created a long-term positive relationship with the Zimbabwean elite. Uh, China had come to balance against the Soviet Union following the 1969 border war and the U.S. looked favorably on strengthening China through trade so it could stand up to the Soviet Union and thereby distract a large part of the Soviet military, which was in fact successful. This was a U.S. plan going way back to the 1950s where there was a very uh, intelligent understanding of the balance of power logic and that the U.S. knew that despite the fact that China and the USSR were both communists, that inevitably power adjacent to power leads to hostility and that the U.S. should not antagonize China. And it's one of the principal reasons why the U.S. was willing to negotiate peace and an armistice in Korea and not invade North Vietnam. Because winning the Vietnam Wars and the Korean War was not worth losing China. The seventh period is the post-Cold War alliances, which essentially start with the Tiananmen Square Massacre, June 4th incident, 1989, in which the West stopped providing weapons to China, particularly the European arms embargo. Here, China's allies were North Korea, and North Korea was, of course, an ally with both mainland China and the Soviet Union. But with the collapse of the Soviet Union, North Korea could no longer get the level of subsidies it needed in order to survive as a viable state. And so it shifted its uh, alliance much closer to China than the Soviet Union. Prior to that, it had leaned against China uh, within the communist sphere. There was Myanmar, uh, which became an ally following a military coup in isolation by the West. Uh, there were friendly relations with Iran, Israel, Iraq, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, Venezuela, Fiji, Cuba, Russia, Thailand, Oman, and Saudi Arabia. For Saudi Arabia, it was a commercial exchange. China began to import oil and therefore trade arms for oil with countries like Iraq. A lot of the Iraqi weapons used in the Iran-Iraq war and against the uh, 
Allied Coalition in uh, 1991 uh, were uh, of Chinese construction. Israel sold to China or attempted to sell an airborne early warning craft. And when the U.S. Uh, stopped that exchange, uh, Israel uh, sold the LAVI project, which was a U.S. funded aircraft project to China. And this caused a, a severe diplomatic uh, issue between the U.S. and Israel. So the general principles of China's declared alliance policy are as follows. One, China does not interfere in the domestic affairs of the state. And in practice, it has consistently interfered in the domestic politics of India in Assam. So where India was supporting the Kampa Tibetan rebellion against China, the Chinese retaliated by supporting insurgents in the Assam region of India's northeast. China backed uh, the uh, Karen people in Myanmar. Now, Myanmar is poorly is a state that's poorly controlled from the center. It's very fragmented. There are various tribes, including uh, tribes that are Christian, that are supported by non-governmental groups from the west. And so, to safeguard its frontier from uh, um, primarily crime and smuggling issues, because Myanmar was a part of, of the Golden Triangle at one point, which was a uh, uh, fields of opium that were run by former members of the Taiwanese military that retreated after the Chinese Civil War and they used that as a base to conduct anti-communist operations as well as to secure a, a pro, uh, pro-Taiwanese uh, uh, warlords uh, in the region. Uh, China, of course, uh, invaded Vietnam in part uh, to retaliate for the Vietnamese invasion of Cambodia in 1979, but also on behalf of the Bien Hoa Chinese and the large Chinese community in Vietnam that were uh, seen to be discriminated against. Uh, China, of course, uh, provided weapons to uh, those Chinese in Indonesia in the 1950s and 60s that were pro-communist, and the British spent a significant amount of time trying to stop that flow of arms uh, that ultimately uh, led to the 1965 Indonesian coup that killed about a million people, including uh, wholesale targeting of what were believed to be uh, pro-communist Chinese in the country, and the installation of uh, General Saharto, replacing uh, President uh, Sukarno, who was much more sympathetic uh, to the Chinese. Uh, there were similar uh, interferences in places like Malaya and Singapore. In Malaya, there was, of course, the emergency, where primarily landless Chinese peasants um, escaped to the jungle next to the plantations and uh, conducted a communist insurgency that was ultimately defeated, organized by the uh, British, the counterinsurgency, with help of the uh, local Malay population. And Singapore, which uh, a, a, a dealt aggressively with ethnic Chinese uh, communist influence from the mainland. Uh, there was Thailand, uh, w which had links with, um, or rather the Chinese had links with Thai communists. And of course, in Afghanistan, uh, China provided some of the weapons for the Mujahideen insurgents in the 1980s as a part of the Western effort to uh, drain the Soviet military presence there. So China, in fact, does interfere in domestic affairs a lot. And here we've not even spoken about their efforts in Africa, which are fairly uh, broad standing, including uh, their supportive operations against uh, Rhodesia that ultimately created the state of Zimbabwe. Number two. Reliance on land buffers to protect its territory. So China uses countries like North Korea, North Vietnam, Pakistan, Laos, and Myanmar, and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization to push away Russian or Western or Indian uh, allies that would be encroaching directly on the frontier with China. So measuring the China Block Alliance. So the first issue is how fragile or robust is the China Block? you know, the alliance consisting of North Korea, Pakistan, and Myanmar. Number two, under what circumstances would China come to the aid of its allies? Uh, I, or one, would China permit itself to witness the further dismemberment of Pakistan, right? Uh, China promised to help Pakistan in 1965, it didn't do very well. And then 1971, it promised again, but essentially stood by as India detached East Pakistan to become Bangladesh, cutting Pakistan's population in half. If India were to attack Pakistan and split Sindh from the Punjab, would China have the capacity to intervene over the Himalayas? Number two, would it permit the collapse of the Pyongyang regime? Would it intervene with military force to take on the South Koreans or the Americans as they advanced north? 
Number three, would Beijing tolerate threats to the survival of the regime in Napidya, which is the capital of Myanmar? Third, in turn, would Pakistan, North Korea, and Myanmar assist China in a war over Taiwan, or the South China Sea, or with Japan over the Riku Islands? So how deep is this alliance, and do the individual allies of China have an understanding of the strategic, strategic issues that are important to Beijing, and would they therefore participate in the same way that NATO has an automatic trigger if there is an act of aggression against any one NATO member? Now the implication is that if the China bloc is robust, then any confrontation with China would escape containment and quickly spread from the East China Sea to the Arabian Sea. So any country uh, having to confront China would, would uh, uh, have to have military forces in more than one ocean to deal with the various linked contingencies. Alternately, if the China bloc is fragile, then Beijing is likely to find itself quickly isolated and its assertion of power is more likely to create further balancing and self-encirclement policies. You can see here the gradual growth in the membership of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Of course, most of the members are dialogue partners and observers, where member states are a minority. But the logic for China is as an instrument of exclusion to keep other countries out from its immediate sphere of influence. So indicators of alliance robustness, and there are six. Number one, predisposition of a state to irreversibly commit itself, whether by deployment or incurred audience costs, to the extent of risking a chain ganging. Now, uh, a deployment would be a country committing itself by deploying soldiers on the ground with the idea that once war broke out, it'd be difficult for the soldiers to leave. And very likely, these soldiers would be deployed on the front line or near the front line. The U.S. 2nd Division used to be deployed in the Weijangbu Corridor between the very short distance between the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea and the South Korean capital of Seoul. The U.S. has since pulled back brigades of that 2nd Infantry Division all the way down to Busan because South Korea today is very, very strong. China has not made a large-scale foreign deployment, but one could imagine a Chinese brigade, for example, de deployed at Gwadar in Pakistan to secure that port against a U.S. Marine landing, for example. Uh, there are Chinese troops deployed just across the Yalu River with chemical and nuclear protection training in the event of a, an escalation uh, that leads to an intervention against North Korea. Number two, the extent to which states were eager to resolve or at least sustain dormant important territorial issues. I mean, to what extent are old issues brought up in the education of the children and in the day-to-day -day media? Uh, and in particular, um, in the case of Pakistan or North Korea, do they discuss Taiwan? Do they highlight how important it is for China and whether uh, uh, Pakistan has a contributory role in that type of contingency. Equally, does Chinese media and Chinese common education raise the issues of Kashmir for Pakistan or reunification of the Koreas for North Korea? Number three, whether the state has transferred any capital weapons that could risk blowback through the target state's change of alignment or through further proliferation of those weapons. These would include powerful and in particular difficult to procure weapons such as nuclear warheads, missile submarines, warships, airborne early warning aircraft, and fourth and fifth generation combat aircraft. The logic being that capital weapons would be traded if there was a high level of confidence and the persistent allegiance of an ally. States almost never share nuclear weapons and the one exception are democracies. Democracies, because of the democratic peace, because of the procedural legalistic interaction between the states, as well as norms that exist in how democracies judge each other, there have been some counterintuitive sharing of nuclear weapons technology, particularly by the US to France, when uh, both Richard Nixon, US President, and French President Charles de Gaulle were in power. So overtly hostile to, to each other, but in reality, because they were both democracies, there was a technically illegal trade in nuclear technology from the U.S. to France. This indicates the U.S. had a very high level of confidence in 
the French promise not to share the weapons. When China assists nuclear weapons development in Pakistan, it's assuming the same thing. When China gives weapons to North Korea, it assumes that North Korea is not going to spread that technology. So capital weapons is a, a good overarching label for these kinds of weapon systems. And if they're being transferred, it indicates that there's a, a, a fairly a high level interaction between the military bureaucracies and a high level of confidence that the country is not going to undergo a political change that leads to a change in international alignment. Now, this is particularly important because Pakistan has multiple foreign countries that have influence, including the West, through the essentially um, uh, English speaking Western educated legislature in Pakistan, up to 20% of which have Western citizenship in either the US, the UK, or Canada. So there's a very strong influence of Western democracy and civil society. There's, of course, the 15 to 20% of Pakistan's population that's Shia, uh, that is quite closely uh, aligned, at least religiously, with Iran. There are, of course, uh, a large numbers of Salafist communities, fundamentalist Islamic communities that get funding from Saudi Arabia and believe in the use of Sharia law in day-to-day -day life in Pakistan. And finally, there's the military, bureaucratic, and political alignment with China. So all four of those intermesh in Pakistan, making for a very complicated interaction. But China has the confidence that Pakistan's not about to change uh, and drop China. Pakistan simply has no alternative but to have China as an ally. Number four, whether the states provide permanent basing rights within their territory for the outside power. So far, none of North Korea, Myanmar, or Pakistan have provided permanent naval basing facilities for Chinese ships. Uh, the Soviet Union got temporary basing in places like Latakia, Syria, Alexandria, Egypt, Socotra Island off the coast of Yemen. They had permanent bases in Cuba, but they promised not to have nuclear weapons on board those ships. Uh, there were air, aircraft bases operating out of Angola, Guinea-Bissau, uh, Mozambique, uh, Ethiopia. Uh, occasional uh, uh, aircraft, Soviet aircraft, would fly out of Sri Lanka. But China has a base in Djibouti that's permanent, and that's it. Number five, the extent of strategic military coordination is indicated by permanently exchanged military or intelligence staffs. This is particularly true of Pakistan with regard to uh, counterinsurgency and counterterrorism against militant Takfiri groups uh, and even uh, non-Takfiri and non-militant uh, Turkic groups like Etim that are operating uh, to help the Uyghurs in Xinjiang province. Number six, if there are policies by the larger power to coordinate economic, technological, and diplomatic synergies between the states. And uh, it doesn't seem to be true because Myanmar has uh, primarily an internal focus, although they would like to interact with Western countries. North Korea is uh, uh, not closely allied with China. They're, they're, to some extent, reluctantly bandwagoning because of the absence of the Soviet Union. And again, Pakistan uh, is heavily penetrated by multiple interests, of which China is perhaps the most important single source of influence, but it's not going to be able to undo important institutions like democracy. So the first ally, North Korea. China and North Korean relations have often been characterized as friendship. Uh, and this goes way back to uh, 1950, um, uh, particularly when North Korea needed the assistance of China after uh, U.S. General MacArthur landed uh, U.S. Marines under the aegis of the United Nations at Incheon, a port near Seoul, and then surrounded and destroyed the North Korean army stuck in, in the southern end of the Korean Peninsula, and then U.N. forces pushed over Pyongyang, the North Korean capital, and advanced on the Yalu River, which is the uh, border between North Korea and China. So the foreign policy of the DPRK, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. North Korea's dem domestic policy envisions a neo-Confucian social order characterized by a strong nationalist impulse that com compels it to seek economic and military autarky and the territorial reconstitution of Korea through reunification with the South and assertiveness against any territorial concessions. This principle of juche, or self-reliance, is pursued at great cost in state wealth and power and contributes to the principal elite concern of regime survival. 
So what are the alliance implications? The alliance implications are that under current circumstances, North Korea is very reluctant to either commit to an alliance whose goals exceed North Korea's narrow unification interests, or to concede territorial concessions over the Chiang Mai mountain area with China. North Korea is willing to share capital weapons if it improves the likelihood of achieving unification with South Korea, Mil militarily, of course. So North Korea feels betrayed by China in every respect, except it believes that China will preserve the independence of the state and the regime in order to maintain it as a buffer against U.S. influence. They signed the Sino-North Korean Mutual Aid and Cooperation Friendship Treaty in 1961, 1981, and 2001, reasserting China's promise to defend North Korea if it is attacked. China refused North Korea nuclear weapons in 1964 and ballistic missiles thereafter, but it does provide North Korea with energy for its economy and select technological assistance. Now, China's North Korea policy is the goal is the maintenance of North Korea as a buffer against U.S. pressure directly on its border, and it was this goal that guided China's entry into the Korean War in 1950. However, China recognizes that an overly aggressive North Korea could provoke Japanese armament, particularly in nuclear weapons, and push South Korea towards the U.S. even further. China recognizes it is under risk of being chain-ganged into a conflict triggered by North Korea. China-Pakistan relations. This relationship is frequently described as all-weather friend. And this is uh, a, a characterization since 1959, when Pakistan began exploring uh, relations with China in the event that the U.S. wasn't going to support Pakistan wholeheartedly. The U.S. provided weapons to Pakistan primarily to keep the Soviet Union from easily invading through Afghanistan and Iran or Pakistan to get to the Indian Ocean. The weapons were not intended to be used against India, and in fact that was a condition of the weapons being given to Pakistan, which Pakistan very quickly uh, went back on when they deployed M48 patent tanks from the U.S. in the Ran of Kutch uh, dispute in the lead-up to the 1965 Indo-Pakistan War. Pakistan is a defensive state providing Muslims in South Asia a safe haven against what it perceives as a resurgent Hinduism or Hindutva. Pakistan relies on China to counterbalance the existential threat that India poses to Pakistan as well as to provide it the conventional and nuclear technology necessary to counter Indian nuclear weapons. Pakistan surrendered substantial territories to China in 1963 in a treaty in exchange for good relations with Beijing, although the territory handed over were primarily minority areas in the Hindu Kush and the Himalayas. Alliance implications. Pakistan is disinterested in China's broader energy interests in the Indian Ocean and the Persian Gulf or Taiwan and the South China Seas and is reluctant to get involved in any broader confrontation with China against either the US or Japan. And this is largely because of the penetration of Pakistani society, which is, from a political cultural standpoint, profoundly committed to democracy. Even the military is committed to, to democracy. And this, 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 is, this is indicated by the generally short amount of time that the military stays in power and the very small number of fatalities that occur every time there's a military coup. So China's Pakistan policy. Pakistan's alliance with Beijing addresses three vital interests of China. Number one, counterbalancing India. With a relatively small provision of conventional and nuclear assistance from China, Pakistan is able to counterbalance India to the extent of distracting New Delhi from its focus on China and Tibet to facing Pakistan in the Punjab. In effect, Pakistan neutralizes India, a key adversary of China. In the area of nuclear technology, missiles, tanks, and aircraft, China is Pakistan's largest supplier. India's military is larger than Pakistan's. Uh, China, uh, India's got seven times the population and seven times the economy of Pakistan, but only twice the military. Now, India's military is largely dispersed on, in cantonments in northern India. Uh, and northern India, of course, stretches from the west uh, on the Pakistani border 
uh, across the northern uh, frontier, which faces China and Nepal and Bhutan, all the way to the northeast, which faces the Chinese border, uh, as well as uh, Bangladesh and Myanmar. So uh, the actual total number of Indian forces facing Pakistani forces on, near the Pakistani border in the Punjab or Rajasthan is only about two thirds. So in a, in a quick conflict with Pakistan, Pakistan will have military superiority for a short period of time until uh, India is able to send reinforcements on the Pakistani border. So with very little investment, China is able to keep India relatively insecure and to compel it to focus most of its strategic anxiety on Islamabad and not China. It's a neat trick. Number two, energy conduit to the Persian Gulf. Pakistan gives China direct geographic access to the Indian Ocean through the Karakoram Highway and the port of Gwadar into the Indian Ocean and onto Iran and Saudi Arabia and the Persian Gulf, where China gets most of its oil imports. Pakistan is also a helpful Muslim interlocutor with the Muslim Persian Gulf. Now, to what extent Pakistan is able or willing to help China in a large-scale war is unclear. The, the first problem is that the Karakoram Highway is very precarious, and even Chinese academics recognize that it's very unlikely to be a secure source of uh, oil from the Persian Gulf, first because it's going to be difficult to get the oil in a war from the Persian Gulf to the port of Gwadar in Pakistan, and then to secure that very long pipeline or the very long train of tankers going up through the Himalayas bring oil. So the amount of oil coming through Gwadar up the Karakoram Highway will be a mere fraction of the amount of oil that Russia could bring, for example, to China by pipeline through Siberia, and even that amount is inadequate. So, China extended the Bricks and Roads Initiative to Pakistan, and in fact, Pakistan is the largest recipient of BRI infrastructure investment, totaling $60 billion investment in the CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. This consists of essentially a link from Gwadar and from the port of Karachi along several highways that ultimately converge on the Karakoram Highway and then go into uh, China's Xinjiang province, the city of Kashgar in the uh, far west of China. There are 12 special economic zones located along the route of this infrastructure. Uh, the infrastructure consists of highways, rail, port and energy producing facilities, plus associated industrial areas uh, that can benefit from the infrastructure and from the uh, energy sources. Uh, it is not without controversy. The vast majority of Pakistani uh, uh, regional and national leaders support the project. But marginalized parts of marginalized regions like Balochistan and Khyber Pakhtunwa, what is the former Northwest Frontier province, there have been attacks on Chinese and uh, Chinese workers and on Pakistani workers working on these projects. Uh, but this is this is not so much anti-Chinese in the sense of the uh, the type of detour politics that uh, have uh, hurt China and Africa. Pakistan is quite happy to take on debt. Uh, because China in the past has uh, uh, rescheduled the debts with Pakistan. They're reliable alliance partners, and Pakistan has the financial infrastructure to at least attempt to pay it back. Uh, but uh, Pakistan is a multilingual state where the uh, core of the state is the Punjab, where 45% of the population lives, and there is significant political and distributive inequality in the state. Uh, and th this, of course, is the, the fundamental reason why Pakistan split up in 1971 between East Pakistan that turned into Bangladesh and West Pakistan that became Pakistan today. The third motive is buffering Xinjiang. Pakistan is an important buffer against insurrectionary Islamist infiltration into China's predominantly Muslim Xinjiang province. Uh, currently, China's got a very elaborate detention system uh, which contains at least a million Uyghurs who have been incarcerated and either put into forced labor or uh, and or re-education camps. Xinjiang contains 40% of China's coal, 25% of its oil reserves, and 13% of its oil production. Islamist 
violence, which is essentially uh, simply liberation violence, but it uses Islam as a method of uh, aggregating uh, that movement, has been ongoing since 1990. And China has exerted pressure on Pakistan to suppress the Uyghur insurgents and Etim, the East Turkestan independence movement. Pakistan has consistently sacrificed its Islamic principles to round up and deport to China for almost certain execution hundreds of Uyghurs, many of whom are peaceful activists. In 2007, China pressured Pakistan to conduct a bloody military assault on a mosque, the Lal Masjid, in order to rescue some Chinese prostitutes who had been kidnapped by local Muslim religious uh, uh, people, workers, from the mosque, and this led um, uh, to an attack on the mosque in which a number of individuals died. I spoke to one special service group member. These were the commandos the Pakistanis sent into the facility. And this is, uh, of course, it's a, a multi-ethnic organization. It's not only uh, Punjabi. And although Pakistan is a Muslim state, the SSG is the elite of uh, Pakistani special forces in the Pakistan military and their primary allegiance is to the uh, military um, uh, uh, organization and so they could easily do this without blowback in the military. Now this event uh, was traumatic for uh, Salafists and uh, Takfiris in Pakistan and led to the creation of the tariq e taliban which is the Pakistan Taliban operating in Pakistan Khyber Pakhtunwa, primarily the Pashtun people of uh, Pakistan, and then they started a uh, um, basically a series of attacks on the Pakistani state and military, some of which have been very high profile and have led led Pakistan to some uh, pretty brutal uh, retaliation against the populations of Pashtun in Khyber Pakhtunwa that supported the Tariq e Taliban. So what are the risks? Pakistan's domestic obsession with Indian-occupied Kashmir led to the 1947-48, 1965, and 1999 Indo-Pakistan wars, the last one of which was uh, occurring under the nuclear umbrella. And China has repeatedly tried to restrain Pakistan. However, there's no risk of chain-ganging, as China did not intervene against India in either the 1965 or the 1971 Indo-Pakistan wars, largely because of the difficulty of doing so over the Himalayan mountains. Furthermore, in Pakistan, China is constantly competing for influence with the US and Saudi Arabia. So China does not completely dominate uh, Pakistani interests. China-Myanmar relations. The term most commonly used is Pakfa or kinfolk relationship between China and Myanmar. So the foreign policy of Myanmar. Myanmar's foreign policy goal of securing its autonomy and territorial integrity has remained constant since its independence. Although China considers Myanmar within its sphere of influence, Myanmar concedes only that it is currently insufficiently strong to escape China's power. China is Myanmar's greatest threat. Myanmar's policy of accommodationism is a recognition of China's capacity to worsen Myanmar's limited ability to assert itself over its own territory particularly among minority populations along the Chinese border, the Kokang, Hua, Akar, and Shan peoples. Myanmar is not strictly bandwagoning since it has not fully submitted itself to Chinese interests and has sought continuously to establish contacts with outside states. The 1988 coup by the Myanmar army, the Tat Mada, led to its isolation from the West and commerce and dependence on China for weapons. You can see here China's fantasy scenario in the top right, which is a infrastructural line, just like the Karakoram Highway in Pakistan, that would link the Bay of Bengal uh, into uh, China's uh, Yunnan province. The overwhelming issue for China is an attempt to bypass the Strait of Malacca, through which 80% of China's oil imports travel and it's a very narrow strait and very easily shut down. So China would prefer to receive its oil from the Indian Ocean and then uh, secure it into a more uh, terrestrial um, area where it can secure it. Now you can see on the bottom right the different 
uh, ethnic groups along the uh, Chinese frontier, which makes it a, a complicated um, a governance issue for both Myanmar and China. China can always leverage its proximity to arm these people so that Myanmar is not able to administer that part of the country. And you can look at the diversity of language and ethnicities on the map on the left side. China's Myanmar policy. China's principal interest in Myanmar is one, maintaining security on its frontier, which it has done so by spreading insurrection in Myanmar through its minority populations along the border. In the 1990s, China sought also to, to use Myanmar as an alternative energy route to the Indian Ocean to bypass the Strait of Malacca choke point. This new relationship is an understanding by Myanmar. Three, not to allow foreign presence on its territory in exchange for Chinese assistance. Now, what are the risks? Because Myanmar is bandwagoning with Beijing, if China's power diminishes, Myanmar will seek an ally to counterbalance China. Findings. The China bloc is fragile for four reasons. One, China and all her three closest allies, North Korea, Pakistan, and Myanmar, are careful to limit their alliance commitments, highlighting their collective unwillingness to be chain-ganged. Two, while China has exported capital weapons to its allies, they have consistently been instrumental as security buffers, rather than for the purpose of achieving the policy interests of its smaller allies. Three, China has not sought nor continues to obtain any foreign bases, aside from several minor listening posts. Four, the absence of a collective threat common to all four allies means that any crisis will remain localized and China can expect a limited ability to open new fronts in the event of a crisis. Attempts by China to synchronize the interests of its allies has been limited, aside from some arms purchases and informal consultations. The implication is that China has only limited success in escaping its geostrategic constrainment and that a containment policy with a view to tying down significant portions of China's terrestrial forces has some reasonable prospects for success. Now, there is some need for interpretation here. In 2022, while China was conducting very heavy exercises off the coast of Taiwan, North Korea was conducting a very heavy missile testing uh, regimen uh, with a view to provoking South Korea and Japan, a form of intimidation. Now, uh, it could be uh, believed that North Korea was doing it with the encouragement of China, but it's far more likely it was taking advantage of the pressure on the U.S. in Taiwan uh, in order to uh, essentially garner um, uh, and appear more of a threat because the U.S. couldn't concentrate that much force uh, or attention against North Korea. It's not clear whether this would benefit China. In many ways, it provokes Japan and South Korea, reducing the American need to intervene and the same power that South Korea and Japan uh, deploys or uh, develops could be later used against China. And in, in any case, in the modern context, uh, North, South Korea is probably more than able to deal with an attack from North Korea. So the likely allegiance of countries in a small US-China war would likely look something like this. You've got China, which is red, and its allies, now, the Allies are not likely to be involved militarily. So that would be North Korea. Uh, Thailand is likely to deny U.S. access to the treaty military bases. Cambodia, although it'll have no effect, is likely to side with China, along with uh, Nepal and Bhutan. Pakistan is very likely to do uh, nothing. Even if the U.S. blockades China, Pakistan is in no position to use its navy to break out of a U.S. blockade and get access to Persian Gulf oil. It might be able to move oil by pipeline from Iran uh, through Pakistan to China, but that amount will be uh, minuscule. You can see blue, in blue the U.S. allies, and it's essentially many of the democracies in the Pacific Rim. India is likely not to get involved, but it would act as a significant barrier and definitely a source of intelligence. And then, of course, there are broader countries in the international system that would provide support to the U.S. Uh, and many of these countries, uh, like Saudi Arabia and Angola, even if they weren't going to be sympathetic uh, 
to uh, the U.S. fight against China. They would be providing oil to U.S. allies. And Europe, of course, would play the same role the U.S. did in World War I, which would be a large uh, source of industrial power that the U.S. could buy from to uh, operate its conflict against China. In a war over Taiwan, uh, you could imagine here the Chinese allies versus the uh, U.S. allies. It's, it's possible in this particular scenario that uh, Pakistan and North Korea um, could gradually become involved as China make re requests on them, or they might bandwagon. North Korea might lock itself down if it sees China's initial amphibious landing on Taiwan uh, resulting in a, in a catastrophe. Obviously, if North Korea starts a conflict against South Korea, with a view that, you know what, there are Chinese troops uh, in Heilongjiang province, they're too far to be deployed against Taiwan, so at least we could chain gang them and drag them into a war uh, against South Korea, so this would be North Korea's one chance to win, and the US would be too distracted to intervene, and Japan simply doesn't have the military force. So it could result in a very costly stalemate for South Korea. And in a large-scale war, which uh, you know would escalate from a small conflict over Taiwan to a much larger uh, global conflagration, there would be a great many countries in Africa that, while they're sympathetic to China, would probably bandwagon with the U.S. and would therefore be functionally neutral while still engaging in commerce with the West. And so here, obviously, the Western advantage in naval power for the moment uh, would give them uh, that one advantage. So about one third of the countries in the world and probably uh, something like 60%, 70% of the world's economy would be backing the U.S. The uh, A great many of those uh, uh, populated areas like Africa, which don't have a large economy but do have a very large population, uh, would effectively be neutral along with uh, South America and many countries in the Middle East. So China's foreign policy frames. What is the underlying philosophy of China's foreign policy? You can see here a depiction of the different bases near uh, China and how many troops are uh, deployed there. You can see in Japan there's 40,000 troops. They don't show you Okinawa, which is where most of the Marines are deployed. Uh, it does show that there are 16,000 troops that are afloat in ships, of course. South Korea's got a, uh, a division, the 2nd Infantry Division, plus various air units. Philippines has got troops on rotation, although in February of 2023 there was a negotiation for access to bases in Luzon, and uh, while there were uh, positive signals that the Philippines would prepare the bases for the U.S., the U.S. is not allowed to permanently base there, which is very problematic if China conducts an amphibious landing because the Philippines only has uh, about uh, two divisions in the northern part of Luzon with very little armor uh, to resist a marine landing on its coast. Uh, Singapore, of course, has uh, a station for the uh, U.S. military and the Americans are deployed quite heavily in Australia. So the first policy frame is Confucian. The Confucian approach in foreign policy is characterized by the core belief that peace is precious because of China's historic chaos phobia and focus on the integrity of its society. That Japan eschews hegemony and that China is always militarily defensible, defensive. As China becomes stronger, its increased confidence in domestic stability will lead to a reduction in its proneness to use force. Under the Confucian foreign policy philosophy, we would expect it to find a China that only engages in sincerely preemptive or retaliatory military action, and in which military force is a last resort once negotiations have reached an impasse, and in which military action is in response to concerns that threaten China's domestic stability. Now, the alliance implications of the Confucian foreign policy frame are that alliance policy is that China will place its domestic stability ahead of balance of power requirements and will therefore risk abandonment of its allies rather than being chain-ganged into a conflict not of its own choosing, unless the risks and the costs of such a conflict were believed to be very low. This, of course, would not be the case with Kashmir. China will also be receptive to compromises with its allies, particularly over territory, unless that territory contains a significant Han or historically subject minority population. China would be willing to share capital weapons to contiguous states that do not pose any probable threat to its domestic stability or to any non uh, 
contiguous state. The second foreign policy frame is real politik. This approach argues that while China's declaratory policy is Confucian, its operational doctrine, what it's actually going to do by, by training, is based on power politics, best described by offensive realism. Real politics expects China to adapt to the self-help anarchic conditions of the international system characterized by a balance of power with little regard for historical precedent, with the implication that China's rise in power will produce a concomitant rise in demands for a greater share in the distribution of benefits of the international system. China's foreign policy is driven by divide and rule methods. In this conception, China is a revisionist power. In other words, it wants to change how the system works. It wants to displace the US. China's peaceful rise or peaceful development is simply therefore a period of internal balancing. China will seek to establish unprecedentedly distant spheres of influence if it has sufficient power and will quickly update objectives as it acquires the power to further expand. In other words, China's foreign policy will flow from the power of a gun. So the alliance implications of real politique are China's potentially unlimited ambition renders it desperate for allies and therefore a tendency for it to overcommit to its alliances to limit abandonment, thereby risking chain gang. China is also therefore likely to concede on territorial disputes with states willing to be its allies. In line with China's balance of power focus, it is willing to share capital weapons, like nuclear weapons, with states when they cost-effectively substitute for China's own military. You can see here the uh, bike do Changbai mountain dispute between North Korea and China, uh, which North Korea would like to claim all of. The tributary foreign policy frame. This approach to foreign policy asserts that China is seeking a return to the status quo ante of the arrival of the European powers. In other words, what it was like before the Europeans began dismantling China's sphere of influence but that this assertion of influence and power will taper off significantly once China's regional territorial interests have been satisfied. In effect, it is a variant of the Confucian approach with the modification that China's current high level of aggressiveness is a function of its belief that it is in the domain of territorial losses, especially with regard to Taiwan, the South China Sea, the East China Sea, Arunachal Pradesh, segments of Siberia and those states that were formerly tributary. So the frame, uh, the logic of the frame is that uh, when a country is in the domain of losses because it believed it had something and then it lost it, it's desperate to recapture it. And this causes its foreign policy to become volatile and risk acceptant and therefore difficult to deter. You can see here we're using the metaphor of a gambler. When a gambler wins new money, they're happy. When they lose old money, they're far more desperate to try to recoup that money, much more aggressive and risk prone. The geographic extent sought is that of the Han population, which is seen as coterminous with Chinese civilization. Hence the need to include Taiwan. China's assertiveness is also seen as seeking to repair the damage done during its century of humiliation at the hands of the colonial powers in the mind of China's elites, the tributary system is comprised of a Chinese hegemony to establish stability, whose order benefits all members with the peace necessary for trade, and which is an alternative to the disorder of a balance of power process. China's goals are therefore historically prescribed, geographically limited, and satiable. So here you can see the countries that fall within China's historical sphere of influence and we would expect to be subjected to this overly aggressive foreign policy. But that once China secures the territories it has claims uh, in these areas or these countries subjugate themselves to China's sphere of influence by essentially subordinating their foreign policy, then China is going to become far more conservative and Confucian in its foreign policy.
The alliance implications of a tributary policy is that China will seek to dominate its periphery, including its allies, and inhibit, inhabit the periphery, and will therefore rely on threats to force bandwagoning rather than risk chain ganging. China will offer few territorial concessions to its allies. However, China's assertiveness will decline rapidly beyond its immediate periphery. So the findings. The tributary frame has the most validation, that China is behaving aggressively to recapture territories lost during the 19th century for which there is significant domestic legitimacy. The Confucian approach is refuted by China's repeated and obvious aggressive use of military force. The real politique frame is refuted by China's underutilization of its power resources. It has maintained a small nuclear force, made few claims to Russian Siberia and its resources, and come to durable territorial agreements with a number of its neighbors precluding further expansion. The implications for an alliance policy are the tributary frame suggests that China will seek to compel North Korea, Myanmar, and Pakistan less so into tributary states with constrained foreign policies. The implications for U.S. policy are the prospects for containment. Against a Confucian frame, yes, containment is possible since China's goals are limited and its means are peaceful. In a real politic environment, no, containment has very little prospects since China has unlimited aims. In, against a tributary frame, it depends. The prospects for containment depend on if China is granted its traditional sphere of influence, then yes, there will be containment quite easily since China's goals are limited. However, if China is denied its traditional sphere of influence, then no, containment will not work, deterrence will fail, because China's limited goals will forever be frustrated. Here you can see NATO's surrounding of both China and Russia from the perspective of Beijing and Moscow. 